And now I'd like to introduce Kevin Kirby, who is Vice President for Administration at RISE, who's going to give the welcome and the introduction to world usability. Thank you.
share with you some of my favorite usability failures and successes on items that uh, you're all uh, very familiar with. Sometimes users, or sometimes designers, uh, hide things from us. And so I was at Bob Burke's repair board trying to wash my hands and dry my hands. <laughs> and couldn't find the paper towels. <laughs> and there they are. And apparently I wasn't the only one who complained about this because I traveled through there a while later. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as a usability professional, anytime you have to message this hard in order to have people dry their hands, you probably fail. <laughs> the other thing designers sometimes fail to do is uh, uh, understand the cognitive limits of users. And so, our security experts are very good at making this big, make big long password with upper, lowercase, and symbols and numbers, and they make us change them every month. They won't let us reuse old ones. Unfortunately, that exceeds the capacity of human memory. So what do we all do? We dutifully write them down on post-it notes and put them on the sides of our mind. So <laughs> <laughs> everybody can get more. The other thing people, designers do is they sometimes ignore perception limitations of people. And so uh, Metro Rail has a habit of driving into cars. And so to their credit, they decided they were going to try and uh, create a campaign that would uh, promote people not driving into their trains. <laughs> and they did that by painting this train bright red and said, stop and think. Unfortunately, we know from human perceptual data that red is one of the least visible colors, uh, particularly in the dark. They already know what color they should do it. Look at their, uh, whoopsie, gracious.
thought you might enjoy seeing a program in action. He shared with us a short video showing how Rice engineering and business students collaborate to bring health technologies to Africa. Called the land of a thousand hills, Rwanda is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. But this tiny, densely populated country in the heart of Africa also has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world. The average Rwandan dies by the age of 46. Most of Rwanda's 10 million citizens subsist on what they grow, earning less than a dollar a day. They suffer from bacterial diarrhea, TB, malaria, hepatitis, AIDS, and lung diseases. Most Rwandans have no electricity or clean water. The challenges are immense. Rwanda needs doctors and equipment and jobs. 10,000 miles away at Rice University in Houston, Texas, business professor Mark Epstein prepares 20 MBAs for their journey to Rwanda. Epstein and his students are planning to help Rwandan entrepreneurs launch businesses using biotech products developed and tested by Rice engineering students. For years, Rice professor Rebecca Richards Cordham and her engineering students have been creating and testing biomedical products to improve healthcare in developing countries. When Richards Cordham heard about Epstein's work in microfinance, she asked Epstein and his MBAs to combine forces with her students to create commercially viable biotech products for the third world. So it was really wonderful um, to meet him and to learn about his work in micro entrepreneurship, the impact that it's had around the world, and then to begin to think how we might team up and um, bring some of the strengths of engineering together with the strengths of business so that solutions that we designed could go from more than just a few prototypes to many, many devices that could be meeting the need they were intended to meet. We are focusing on four health technologies. Three of these health technologies were developed by the Rice Bioengineering Department and one other. And we picked products that had different price points and different markets. So we have this diagnostic lab in a backpack, which has probably got a price point of a thousand dollar plus. We have a uh, incubator uh, for babies with jaundice with Billy Rubin lights, which has a, maybe a market price of a hundred dollars or so. Then we have a dosing device for liquids which has a market value of maybe a couple of dollars. And then we have these micronutrient supplements, which would have a sale price of maybe seven or 10 cents. And so what it does for the students is it provides challenges at different levels. You have different markets, different, each one has different manufacturing challenges, different dissemination challenges, different supply chain challenges. So each of them has different challenges so each the students could learn from each other's projects. It, it, they were projects I thought the students could handle and really make a big difference in really trying to uh, move this forward and possibly solve some global health problems. Epstein's four teams had little more than a week to meet with Rwandan health officials, visit hospitals and remote clinics, and determine a market for their biotech products. We followed the incubator team. In the span of a week, the team first located a Rwandan furniture maker to build a prototype incubator. On their second day, they wired and tested the incubator's heating unit in their hotel room. On the third day, they worked side-by-side -side Rwandans to assemble the prototype. On the fourth, they showed the finished prototype to the Rwandan National Testing Lab. And on their last day at a Rwandan pediatrics clinic, they placed a baby in the Rice University incubator. What we're looking to do is develop a model where some entrepreneur like with the micronutrient supplements, maybe they buy them for five cents and sell them for seven cents. They have a profit. They're gonna make a little bit of money, make a living, but they have an interest in continuing to get supplies and continuing to sell. And it's that commerce model that I think is what can really make a big, uh, uh, provide great help in alleviating poverty and solving glo uh, global health problems. 
And so, Mark Epstein's class spent their spring break in Rwanda, flying from Houston to Rwanda's capital, Kigali, the students' relatively modern base of operations in the center of the most densely populated country in Africa, where, for most Rwandans, human power and burning charcoal are primary energy sources, where water is shared from a well, and where medical care is a day's journey away.
may make it for people with dexterity impairments as well. Um, and another great piece of assistive technology that I really enjoy is Kurzweil 3000. That primarily is, is to assist people with learning disabilities. It has all sorts of um, word prediction software and um, highlighting and all sorts of different features attached to it. But it's also a great tool for people to use for whose English is not their first language. It actually reads and translates things in, in different languages as well. And it's just a great study aid for everybody. Um, other examples are automatic door openers. You know, they are a great um, asset for people with disabilities, but I would argue that they're a great, um, uh, very convenient uh, piece of assistive technology for everybody you're carrying things, you don't have to worry about struggling to open the door, and you know, it's even much easier to uh, push a button. Once again, though, the issue of where the automatic door openers are and the contrast that it has with the building is very, very important because you don't have to look for the, the automatic door opener. That sort of, uh, that's sort of a contradiction of what we're trying to achieve in terms of usability and accessibility. So I think you know these things are really important. Um, I'm, I'm just one of many examples of people who have disabilities who are able to live independent and um, very productive lives um, thanks to this uh, assistive technology. I think what we want to achieve is that whether people have a disability or not, you know, we want people to thrive and not just survive. And having good assistive technology is a very important feature of that. And also the usability of it very, very essential because it takes out the mystique of the assistive technology. You don't want the technology to be so specialised that only one or two people can know about it and can help people be set up on it. You know, we, want, we want it to be very usable, we want a lot of people to know about it so that it breaks down barriers between uh, people who need to use the assistive technology and people who can manage without it. That's my um, take on the whole situation, and uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present on it. Please welcome Richard Johnson, Director of Energy and Sustainability, Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Environment and Society, and then Professor of Practice uh, in Environmental Studies and Sociology. He's going to speak about usability and sustainability. It, it was close to the usability moment earlier, so I don't know what's going to
keep or a pool or just have a fan running, but you cannot set programs and have it run at specific, specific times. It was, it was easy to use, but arguably less intelligent than the Minneapolis heat regulator. And it was not designed to help save energy, rather it was, help, it was designed to help us consume in comfort, uh, which you know, nowadays is somewhat problematic. And so this is literally where we began to hit the wall. Uh, the programmable thermostats uh, represented a merger between uh, thermostats and the computer, but you literally have to know how to program a computer in order to be successful <laughs> with, uh, with using them. And God help you, if you needed to change out the battery, then you had to go back and, and reprogram the thing. And so, some of the modern criticisms are that uh, this device is that it's, it's hard to use. Um, and it does not provide uh, feedback on your performance, and you need to be at the device to program it. Uh, and, uh, but it does help to save energy, so that's, that's why they stuck around. But what happens if we reimagine our relationship to fire once again uh, using today's notions of usability and today's technology? One of the, the latest breakthroughs, uh, you may have seen articles about this, one of the latest breakthroughs in home energy management is called the NEST. It's a thermostat that uses a simple interface, uh, the same interface as the iPod. And in fact, it was designed by the same person who designed the iPod uh, interface. And uh, you can also control it remotely from multiple devices. So you can use your iPhone or your iPad or a non-Apple product. Uh, you can control it from your PC. So if you went away on vacation, for instance, and you forgot to set back your thermostat, well, you could just whip out your iPhone while you're at the airport and make the changes. Or if you've got a program running and you realize, oh, I'm going to be late coming home, well, I don't want the air conditioner to turn on just yet. I'll have it turn on at 7 o'clock because I'm going to be home at 7.15. Um, so, but uh, also what the Nest does, it can provide you uh, feedback regarding consumption. And as the old saying goes, what, uh, what is measured gets managed. Uh, so this puts the occupant in a better position of managing her energy use. Now, uh, a focus on usability is helping us to not only manage energy, but manage energy information and the flow of that information, whether it's how we're consuming and where we're consuming that energy. So this is a, a product from uh, Lucid Design that tells you where within your, within your home you're consuming energy. Or it can also help you with setting energy conservation goals. Maybe on January 1st you did very well, January 2nd you didn't do very well at all. And this widget helps you uh, track your, how you're doing, helps you set goals. And uh, uh, there's new technology even to put buildings in competition with each other. This is an example of a building-to-building -building, uh, dorm energy competition at Oberlin College. And in fact, we are looking at this technology to uh, have energy competitions between Duncan and McMurtry Colleges here at Rice uh, as part of a student project. So the, the coming decades will witness, uh, I, I believe, a dramatic transformation and transition in our relationship to energy. And um, the question of whether we can sustain a healthy planet with 9 billion people uh, who aspire to live uh, modern lifestyles is, is essentially the mission critical uh, question of our time. And if we succeed, I firmly believe that usability is going to be, play a central role in making that happen. Welcome Douglas Schuler, Associate Professor of Business and Public Policy, Jones Graduate School of Business, who will speak about a, po a solar power autoclave for medical instrument sterilization. Well, thank you very much for uh, being here today. And thank you, uh, actually Peggy Shaw is not here today. I would thank her personally for providing me. And I'm honored to be here. It's, it's, it's very interesting.
procedures where you, that you would perform in these clinics. So in a place like Houston, you would use very, uh, very modern um, autoclaves. This would be, do something called wet sterilization, and it would be run. It would be run using electricity. The question is, how do you do this when you don't have electricity? So there's a number of alternatives out there. You can use bleach. You can use disposables. You can boil. You can use soap and water. Or actually, what we compete against mostly is you can do nothing at all. That's that's that, that's kind of the baseline that you have to be. Almost all of these have some problems, right? Mostly in terms of efficacy. Some in terms of cost. Some term in terms of logistics and transportation. How do you get how do you get the chemicals? How do you replenish? What happens once that light bulb breaks? Where do you get the next one? So. One of the one of the things that is out there already are very uh, are the use of very simple autoclaves. Uh, this exists. This is a very uh, this is a very old uh, piece of equipment. This was first patented in 1911. Now there's electric models. This one happens to be an electric model. But this this autoclave is going to need power, right? We're, we somehow still have to power this autoclave, and um, so our project we're thinking about. Sustainable source of power. It can't be very expensive. Um, it's got to be fairly easy to use. I don't know if we've really achieved all those things, but that, those are those are the goals. Off-grid power is a major problem. It's been alluded to in in, in the video and Warren's presentation. Uh, the International Energy Agency uh, puts the number about 1.4 billion, and probably another 1 billion or so without very uh, very much power. And these people tend to be concentrated. Here's a map of the world in terms of, uh, of electricity production. You can see some continents essentially go away, right? Sub-Saharan Africa essentially shrinks to, to, to almost nothing. Um, some parts of, uh, some parts of uh, South Asia. So what we're trying to do here at RISE is to say this. Medical provision in off-grid settings is kind of this, this big area that we're trying to pitch into. Uh, we want to sterilize. We want to be part of a sterilization instrument solution. And what we're going to do is we're going to combine an autoclave, which I showed you. I'm going to show you again. Some solar power. I'm going to show you a little device and a coupling device that we actually uh, we, we 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 actually invented and then in parallel with the uh, design project of the mechanical engineering 40708 uh, team. We had a team last year working on something that could put these things together. So our device, and it sits right out there outside of OEDK, if you ever want to see it in action, send me an email. It's called the Cap d'Or Soleil. It was invented by Jean Boubour. Uh, he's a French guy. He also happens to be my father-in-law. <laughs> and uh, he, invented, he invented this thing about 20 years ago and actually uh, has, a, has an IP for it and, and kind of put it out there, but they never were really able to disseminate the technology. This thing basically uses, this is called, this is called a solar concentrator. It's, uh, it, it puts out steam as the output. And um, we did a demonstration. We actually have one uh, installation in Haiti right now. And it puts out, it puts out the steam. The question is, how do we use the steam? Well, what we do is we put it through a uh, hot plate. This is actually machining over in, uh, over in the OEDK. And uh, we put the steam into these grooves, and they circulate in a metal plate. And then we, then we put the auto plate on top of that metal plate. And we kind of pack it in. Um, this is what it kind of looks like in, in total. This is actually one of the, uh, this is one of, uh, one of our former Rice engineering students. This is at the Shell Echo Marathon. We, we were, uh, we were, we displayed down there. And again, you can see the, the device, you can see the box on the back, you can see a, a, a black tube uh, carrying the steam to the autoplay. Our results are superb right now. Last summer, uh, thanks to, to a donor, all the knowledge at the end, we ran 27 trials. Uh, we, we, uh, we had indicators, the type of biological signify that it uh, result in an efficacious uh, sterilization. Uh, we got a bunch of press covered last year on the project, and now right now we, we currently have, uh, we're in discussion with two uh, health uh, NGOs. Uh, they're in 
Sierra Leone right now that I'm meeting with the uh, first lady of the country last week. We're kind of awaiting the results to go pilot the system kind of out in a, in a rural hospital. Um, we have many sponsors, of course, uh, Director of Laboratory Instruction, who will describe a program in which Rice Engineering students adapted wheelchairs to the needs of children at Strider's Hospital. Good afternoon. Viable. 
From there, they begin to prototype, right? which is when you kind of build something to test it. Right? You build it with cheap materials, see if it works. Oftentimes, at that point, you begin to test, and sometimes things work well. Sometimes things don't. You have to do much redesign. And so I list, you know, prototype, build, test, redesign, build, test, redesign, build, because this is one of the projects um, that we actually did quite a bit of iteration on. Um, and so what you see now is, in fact, not one of the initial brainstormed ideas. So I listed these up kind of just to give you some idea of the, of the ideas, right? The students had many, many ideas in, in trying to, to try to solve this problem. And so after uh, much work uh, and thinking and iterating, the students ended up with a solution where they basically took um, parts of a bicycle, right? And I'll explain that in more a second. Basically took kind of the gears and chains of a bicycle, put that onto the wheelchair, okay? And then Pedro was able to interact with that in a way that he could uh, propel the wheelchair. So just to kind of back up and to explain a little bit, I wish we have a stand for the wheelchair. So if you can't see in the back, feel free to stand up. You can come in. It's fine. Okay? So again, when you normally use a wheelchair, right, you reach over, you grab the wheel, and you kind of, yeah, feel free, come on, come on up. I'm in the last spot, so you can move around, right? <laughs> um, you, again, you grab the wheel and you move it forward. Okay, so again, since Pedro couldn't do that, right, you have to think of a way, how can we get the wheel to turn in a different way? So if you think about a bicycle, right, there you use your feet in a different motion, right, to generate wheels going around, okay? So if you think about, there are many different kinds of bicycles. There's some bicycles you could actually paddle with your arms, right, some that you paddle with your legs in kind of different configurations. And so um, what the students were able to design was a way that we could uh, basically push forward here, right, rotate um, a gear with the chain that was connected to, <coughs> excuse me, another gear that was connected to the wheel. And so by pushing this forward, right, it basically turned the wheel. Okay, and so similar to kind of the fancy bicycles you see, right, you can also kind of pedal backwards, but you don't really go backwards, right? So the same thing here. So by having that uh, free spin, right, with a, a spring that pulls, oops, I just, demonstrations were not planned to be a part of this, I know. All right, so it basically will we'll ratchet back, and so then again, Pedro can push and spin. Okay. Does everyone kind of see how this works? So we essentially, we have parts here that were basically cut out from bicycles, so we had a fun time. Well, yeah, metal. That was good. So again, you can see here a little bit of a close-up of the picture of the, uh, the hub uh, and spoke system and then as well as Pedro interacting with it. So this last picture, again, has to really focus on the ability. Okay, so Pedro's ability is he could, he could push forward, right? He has trunk motion, he has fairly good tricep motion. And so the students, again, after many iterations, kind of came to a different design for his, the way that he can interact. So he can basically push forward Right? So that is his ability, and so we were able to use that ability, right, hooked up to the wheelchair, in order to get him to move forward. Um, we have videos of Pedro working, unfortunately they were um, lost, but that's okay. Uh, we're still working with him uh, on this project. So moving forward, um, the project, as we initially designed, does meet some of the design criteria. It doesn't actually meet all of them. Uh, for example, if... Uh, we, uh, we had to kind of extend the width of the wheelchair, right? So that's um, something that's been difficult, but it does still have things such as collapsibility. It's still lightweight. Pedro is able to use it and move the distances he wants. Uh, one of the things is that you guys are giggling about is that we don't have brakes on the system right now, okay? So, you know, we need to work on getting brakes. Um, and then uh, we need a safety review before we kind of hand this over to him because, you know, if you're gonna modify someone's wheelchair, you know, you gotta you got to make sure that it's safe. So we need to do an external engineering safety review. So if any of you uh, have that ability, please let me know. We're with folks. And so again, the key point here is that um, usability is within reach for him. Okay, so we took something that's standard, we modified it for his ability to something that's going to enable him to have uh, considerably more independence. Thank you. We'd like to thank all the speakers for enlightening us on various aspects of usability. Do we have any questions right now for any of them?
Anybody have any questions? I do. I have a question. Oh. Um, for the medical devices and uh, you know, in the wheelchair and the the not necessarily the incubator and everything, how do you get across get past like I mean you are going to Rwanda, but I mean, would it ever fly in the United States, like getting through the medical sort of FDA, the FDA have to get through all that. I mean, it's great that there's all this innovation, but it seems like it would be limited in actual implementation when so, it comes to that. I was going to say, so for us, um, if we're going to, uh, so this is a, a, an extra wheelchair, but if we were to go into Pedro's wheelchair now and make this modification, we would void his warranty. Okay. So that's a risk that the group will take and will make in consultation with his parents. An alternate is to take a second chair, it's maybe of, of lower quality and basically break that, you know fix that one, but that's a real issue. Well, uh, thank you all for coming, and please stop by the displays that are in the foyer of Fondren Library to find out some more about rice usability uh, issues. And let's thank one more time.